the old ways of bottling was really quite fascinating, actually. They had a little machine that had a pump that looked like a, a water pump. You had a foot pedal, uh, like a sewing machine, that would bring the Coke bottle up and then slide it over and put the crown right on top of the stopper, in, the, in this case, right on top of the bottle, and then it would be one bottle at a time. Hermann Henry Biedenhorn, son of an expert cobbler, left Oldenburg, Germany at the age of 17 in his quest to reach America. In 1852, he boarded the SS Hermann in Bremen, Germany, for the several month journey across the Atlantic to the port of New Orleans. With only $2.50 in his pocket, he worked his way upriver, eventually settling in Monroe, Louisiana. There he met Louisa Wilhelmina Lundberg, and they were married on September 27, 1862. As the Civil War ripped across the nation, Herman Henry volunteered his services for the South. With the skills and expertise learned from his father, he was commissioned as a boot repairman for the soldiers in the Confederate Army. The war took him to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where he and his wife eventually settled. After establishing his home and shoe business in 1866, Herman Henry called on his brother, already a successful confectioner, to partner with him in a new confectionery store. That same year, on December 13th, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, Joseph Biedenhorn was born. Joseph was the oldest child in the family, and he loved the confectioner's business. So he started helping his uncle Henry in the confectioner's store across the street from the shoe store. By the time he was about 14, he was working full time in the business and even stopped school to do that. They had a business called Biedenhorn Candy Company, and they were bottling carbonated waters and making candies and selling produce and different things. They had several confectioner stores around town and there were soda fountains in those stores. So they were already selling the Coca-Cola syrup made up in the soda fountains, but it had never been put in bottles before. So Joseph had the idea, since he was already carbonating drinks and, and making flavored waters, that he would put Coca-Colas in bottles. He was the first one to do that, and that was in 1894. When Joseph first started bottling the Coca-Colas, the place that they worked was in the candy store and the soda fountain on Washington Street. From the photographs that I've seen and all, it looked like it was a very labor-intensive operation. Bottling in the 19th century was not nearly the refined process that it is today. There wasn't the sophisticated equipment that we have today that could fill, you know, hundreds of bottles in the course of a minute. This was a slow, very labor-intensive process. They had to wash everything by hand. They had to do everything they could to disinfect. You filled the bottles one at a time. You might be able to fill 50, 100 bottles an hour if you were really, really good. People were experimenting with different types of bottles to see what was going to work best. Most people were using what they were calling Hutchinson stoppered bottles. Originally, Biedenhorn simply used bottles that had the imprint of the Biedenhorn Candy Company on them. Didn't reference Coca-Cola on the bottles at all. So these bottles are very much prized by collectors today because they represent the very first bottle that contained Coca-Cola. Joe Beatenhorn had a machine available to him and Coke seemed like a simple enough thing for him to do. But the real challenge was how to make sure he covered the farm and the, the Mississippi Delta and do it in a way where he could capture the market. And he did it by reaching out and making sure he touched each one of those through his sales team. The early distribution was really based on what roads we had available to us, most of them dirt roads by horse and carriage. You would go out with a truck and hopefully you came back with it empty. Stores set up shop in small communities around big farm towns. He saw a unique market for the farmers and little grocery stores that wanted Coke but couldn't get it. As we grew in our distribution, so did our sophistication in the way we went to business in our sales department. It was, 
I think, seven brothers over there, and they were all over in Vicksburg. He felt like they needed to spread out, and so he came over and bought Monroe. Then some of them began to move here, and they decided they needed to expand it further. And that's when they went out, and Ollie went to Shreveport, Albert went to San Antonio, then they bought Temple, Uvalde, and that spread them out over into Texas and Louisiana. Then there became a lot of controversy as to who should, who should run the Coca-Cola plant. He looked hard at his sons, and every one of them had a part in the business, but he also looked at his grandson as the man to turn to to run the business to take it to the next level. And uh, grandfather called a meeting and headed up at his house and got all everybody around in the dining room. I was sitting there kind of fat, dumb, and happy. And he said, I want him to run the Coca-Cola plant and pointed at me. Well, that's, that's how it all happened. I was kind of surprised, but that's the way it was. Henry, my grandfather, started working at the company after the war and really was a milestone because Coke was expanding in the United States at that point in time. So Henry's challenge was to make sure that he got a Coke in every store and it was able to deliver to those new consumers that we had. And then the real expansion started with Hank. Hank Beatenhorn in 1963 was working on a route truck. He worked his way up and then became uh, president of the company in the early 80s. Hank saw a unique opportunity at that point in time to try to unify all the bottling plants locally so that he can expand our distribution, lower our costs, and become a viable player in, in the bottling industry. I went to work for him in 1990 and I started on a route truck and worked my way up uh, until 1996 when we merged with CC Coca-Cola Enterprise and I stayed with that corporation where I am the branch manager in Monroe. It's in your blood, so to speak, and I think that's the important thing. If you find something you're good at, you find something you enjoy, you stay with it, uh, even if it changes, because change is part of every company. That change has been fun, it's been challenging, but it's also been really necessary. It was one package, one brand, and the change in just the last five years have been to energy drinks, full throttle, Dizani, water is a, now I'm a major seller. So the beverages have changed. So as a company, we're no longer just the Coca-Cola company, we're a total Coca-Cola beverage company. Coca-Cola does not get sold until it's delivered, and that delivery guy has to deliver it at the right place, at the right time, at the right price. And for us to understand the business, we each had to do it as if uh, we were a delivery driver ourselves. So that training became invaluable to running the company and understanding what was important to our business, which is delivering the codes. What was our production like 100 years ago versus our production at this point in time is quite remarkable actually. Back in the 1800s we produced a thousand bottles in a year and back in the 50s and 40s we might do a hundred thousand and in the 60s and 70s we might uh, produce a million cases. We sell five million cases here in Monroe and we produce around 14 to 15 million cases for about a five or six state area. Joseph Beatenhorn was my great, great grandfather. He worked in Vicksburg and then moved to Monroe where he opened the plant in 1912. That tradition carried on to my great grandfather, my grandfather as well as my dad. We since in 1994 celebrated 100 years of, of that tradition. Even though we went from a small family operation and now part of a big corporate operation, uh, there's still a lot of tradition in that, and I'm glad to still be a part of it. The Beatenhorn family has been a very, very important element in the Coca-Cola story. The reason the Coca-Cola is the successful product that it is today was because of the bottlers that went out and developed the markets. At the end of the day, Coca-Cola is a local product wherever it is delivered. Without that kind of a local network, Coca-Cola never would have succeeded. His thought process was almost a decade ahead of the thought process of everybody else who was in the business at that point in time. 
the concept of a franchise bottling plant distributing locally is a concept that we use today all around the globe. So if you go to the Far East, you will find local bottlers of Coca-Cola. If you go into markets like India, markets like Russia, they are doing the things today that the Bedenharns were doing decades ago.